Welcome back to the lab. We're building our own uninterruptible power supply, or UPS. Starting from just basic components, we're going to build this system from the ground up. A UPS, or uninterruptible power supply, is a commercially available piece of equipment, and this supplies power to mains connected loads, like computers and TVs, during a blackout. Before we dive in, let's revisit a part of our projects that's often missed. What could possibly motivate a person to spend months of their life building, designing a UPS when one can just buy one for $300? Well, I, I, I mean, I guess I'm not sure why. What I do know is that I believe that the UPS is available for purchase by consumers like you and me, they have some problems. These systems aren't cheap enough, don't run for long enough, aren't quiet enough, and just aren't good enough. If someone like you or me wants to get a UPS properly sized so we could watch a movie or two during the blackout, keeping a computer and TV on for hours of runtime, we'd probably pay as much for the UPS as we would for a whole computer or home theater setup, which is ridiculous. And while I think these systems are a bit overpriced, there is some complexity inside of them and some regulatory stuff, but these systems require a substantial power converter capable of handling more than 600 watts. During the proof of concept phase for this project, we explored a few different architectures for getting this power conversion done. The two big ideas that we're playing around with are to either use a line frequency transformer and then use a low voltage DC bus, or to use a switch transformer, a high voltage DC bus, and then no output transformer. In our case, we decided for the latter option, so we set out to design a DC to DC converter, which is both isolated and can boost voltages from 11 volts up to 250. Our power supply and inverter shouldn't break a sweat until we hit around 750 watts. Unfortunately, if our calculations are correct, the lead acid batteries may hold us back to around 600 watts. Bottlenecks aside, this kind of power conversion, 600 watts low voltage DC to high voltage, it's the kind of converter that gets electrical engineers, <coughs> and engineers like me on the edge of our seats. Before we get to gawk at how cool our DC to DC converter is, there is some serious work to be done. In order to achieve this level of performance, our design requires a custom transformer which is optimized for relatively high switching frequencies. In this case, we're targeting 100 kilohertz. We're about to walk through our design process for this transformer, and by the end of this video, we'll have walked through our calculations and then hand wound one of these transformers. Once this is all done, we can incorporate it into our custom PCB, which should be delivered very soon. If that sounds great, but you're itching for another great video to watch in the meantime, check out this one, where we upgraded our 3D printer to handle printing PETG filament. This upgrade was necessary to ensure that our 3D printed bobbin can take the heat of our transformer. Transformer time then, starting from square one. Why are we targeting a switching frequency of 100 kilohertz for our transformer? Well, a big design compromise with transformers is switching frequency versus size. If a high switching frequency is used in a transformer, it will reduce the required size of that transformer. This generally reduces the weight and cost of the transformer as well, to a point. The higher our switching frequency becomes, the smaller and smaller our conductors must become, and then we need more and more conductors in parallel to carry the total current required. Now this becomes a serious problem when a lot of power is at play, because eventually we'll need to use a technology called Litz wire, and that contains many individual isolated strands of copper wire that are bound together. The skin effect, which pushes AC current into copper wire away from the center of that conductor, is what makes this necessary. If we wanted to use a 1 inch solid copper bar to carry our power at a frequency of 100 kilohertz, only the outer 19 mils of that conductor is truly carrying current. That might not seem like a big deal until you consider the resistivity of copper. DC resistance of a 1 inch diameter circular bar would consider the whole cross sectional area about 3 quarters of an inch. However, when we subtract the area that carries no current at 100 kilohertz, we're left with a cross section of only 0.06 square inches. And as we know, the resistivity of copper is inversely proportional to the cross sectional area of the conductor. And therefore, this difference would cause our effective resistance at 100 kilohertz to be 13.4 times greater than the DC resistance, which in turn would cause 13.4 times more power to be dissipated in that conductor. Now, I don't know about you, but I typically don't leave an order of magnitude of margin in my designs and therefore it's absolutely critical to take skin effect 
into account at your specific switching frequency in your application. In our case, for our application, we're going to use 26 gauge wire to utilize the full cross-sectional area of our conductor at 100 kilohertz. And then we're going to add enough strands of that wire in our transformer windings to carry the total current required by our design. Did you catch that? Increasing the switching frequency reduces cost and size up until the point where increasing the switching frequency begins to increase the cost and size of the transformer. <laughs> These seemingly contradictory truths exist because at some point a ludicrous number of strands of incredibly small copper wire become necessary. This is an optimization problem. There is no universally right answer for all applications. I picked 100 kilohertz because it's commonly used and it seemed like a good balance point for our UPS project. It's also sufficiently above 30 kilohertz, so it's unlikely that we'll hear any audible noise, coil whine or otherwise, from this power supply. That's important to me just because I hate high-pitched ringing it coming from my electronics. It just doesn't feel good. Moving on from here though, let's talk a little bit more about transformers. Unlike inductors, a true transformer does not store any energy. It simply passes energy from one side to the other. In any transformer, there is a limit to how much energy we can move in one switching cycle. Whether we're using a square wave or a sine wave, this limit always exists, and for a line frequency transformer, there are only 50 or 60 bursts of energy transferred per second. Now that's fine for low power applications, but as the power level rises, these transformers get big, heavy, and expensive. And that's because the magnetic core of these transformers must be able to channel a lot of magnetic flux through them all at once. Now by switching a transformer more often, like 500 or 600 times a second, while we need to move the same quantity of power from one side to the other, we're doing it in much smaller pieces. For example, let's think about moving 100 watts of power. We can choose to move this in 52 watt chunks or 500.2 watt chunks. By moving the same quantity of power in smaller pieces, our transformer does not need to be as physically large. This makes it smaller and cheaper. Now we can't control how much power we need to move through our transformer, that's constant, but we can control how much we move at one instant in time. With this in mind, we're ready to dig deeper into our transformer design. As you know, we like to use free tools as much as possible, and we do this so that you can follow along with our work at home. For an analysis like this, I'd usually capture my work in MathCAD 15, but we're going to try a tool called SMath written by a developer out of Russia because it's free. It's missing some features when compared to MathCAD, but can't argue with the price. It's certainly sufficient for capturing our design process with this transformer and allowing us to tweak design choices to optimize efficiency. We also leveraged a few supplementary articles to build the mathematical model of the system, starting with the losses in our lead acid batteries. There's some pretty reputable looking papers published on the subject online, and considering the power lost in these batteries while pulling power from them is super important. The batteries actually appear to be the biggest place where power is lost in our system, and considering these power losses revealed a bottleneck that restricts the maximum load current for our system. This may also end up revealing the minimum input voltage required to maintain our desired output power when drawing current from the batteries, since voltage will be dropped on the internal resistance of the batteries themselves. The nominal voltage of our lead acid batteries is 12 volts, and this battery consists of six cells. In reality, when charged, these batteries are around 13 volts each for active standby use. When under load, six cells worth of the ESR or series resistance could cause up to 4.1 volts to be dropped across each of those 12 volt batteries when 620 watts of power is being pulled out of the battery terminals. In this load condition, 128 watts of power could be dissipated in the batteries themselves, and therefore, when 750 watts of chemical potential energy is being consumed, only 621 watts is making it out as power passed into the whole UPS. And this is at a voltage of approximately 15.5 volts on the low voltage DC input. That means that even if every other power conversion step is 100% efficient, we'll only be able to use 82% of the chemical energy stored in our lead acid batteries. Now these calculations are all being done on the input side of our DC to DC converter, and since our output voltage needs to be 250 volts DC, the voltage ratio achieved across this converter needs to be at least 250 divided by 15.5, or at least 17. 
Our result of 17 takes into account the nuance that push-pull converters require a maximum duty cycle to be around 90% to make sure you're not shooting through. At any rate, we added a derating factor of 30% to account for resistive losses in the transformer, voltage drop across the rectification diodes, and to add some margin to our minimum input voltage. And this lands us at a turns ratio of 23. This means that for every turn on our primary winding, we need 23 secondary side turns. Zeesh, that's gonna add up fast. In order to keep our number of secondary turns reasonable, we decided to start with a primary turn count of two. That's not very many turns, and if the inductance on our primary side isn't sufficient, this could actually demand a higher switching frequency to prevent our winding from behaving like a short circuit instead of a transformer. Our calculations appear to work out in the MathCAD sheet, green lights all around, but it's possible that I could have made a small error here. Time will certainly tell when we try to power on. Pressing ever onward, we found our input current to be 39 amps at 15 volts, and this information leads us to a peak minimum MOSFET current of 41.5 amps. Using the voltage ratio and input voltage, we calculated that the minimum MOSFET drain to source voltage rating should be at least 85.8 volts to prevent it from breaking down. We selected two PSMN 016-100 PS FETs in parallel, which e with each of these FETs providing a current carrying capability of 57 amps and a voltage rating of 100 volts. With no margin, these FETs should be able to handle a 40 volt input voltage and as an absolute maximum, a uh, current of 55 amps, which is what would happen at an input voltage of 11 volts. While we should design our UPS system to stay as far away from 11 volts and 55 amps, it's good to define the absolute maximum ratings just so we know what they are. Taking the maximum input voltage and translating that across the turns ratio, we find that the maximum voltage applied across our rectification diodes will be 920 volts with a 40 volt input, or 759 volts at our maximum battery voltage, which is our recommended maximum input voltage. By translating 621 watts of power from the batteries into our high voltage output, we should see approximately 2.3 amps of current on our 250 volt DC bus. That's the output of this converter at full load. Our design should have less than 0.67 volts of ripple on that 250 volt bus per switching cycle at full load with only 70 microfarads of bulk capacitance. Since the DC voltage required at our inverter output stage is around 180 volts to maintain 120 volt AC output, this leaves about 70 volts for the 250 volt rail to drop before the mains output would really be affected. I expect this will take about half of a millisecond under full load, and we added provisions to double this capacitance, which should provide about one millisecond of holdup on the high voltage side of the converter. The low side of the converter has bulk two, around 2.3 millifarads. And for every five volts that we set our crossover threshold above 11 volts, that will provide an additional 0.3 milliseconds of holdup, bringing our maximum transition time at full load to 1.3 milliseconds for our transition. Now that'd be pretty tight timing if we don't rely on the holdup of the loads themselves, and at lighter loads, this holdup will be significantly longer. We'll either need to add more capacitance to the system, decrease our maximum load current rating, or relax our specification to allow some dead time during the transition from one supply to the other at full load on the low voltage TC side. We'll see what wins out, but I imagine that our solution will be some combination of the three. This brings us back to the heart of our work, the transformer design. The previous calculations are all critical because if we design a transformer such that it's impossible to buy suitable transistors to switch it or diodes to rectify the output voltage, well, that's not a very useful transformer, now is it? And now we can focus on the magnetic properties alone since we've verified all that. Now we calculate the peak flux density in the core, which is a function of the input voltage, duty cycle, turns ratio, and core cross-sectional area. And the function itself is defined by what our input waveform looks like. Calculating our peak flux density and comparing that to the saturation flux density of our core, we should have about 66% margin, which is awesome, since magnetics enter a soft saturation mode where they're significantly less efficient and therefore get pretty hot before they enter what I would consider to be hard saturation. We selected a TDK E55-2821 core with the N87 core material because that provides sufficient margin on the saturated flux density to give me the warm fuzzies. We evaluated a couple smaller cores with similar materials, but they just didn't have enough cross-sectional area to distribute the flux down to something that commonly used core materials can handle, and I didn't want to get too exotic. 
This converter isn't particularly cutting edge, so I don't think we really need those exotic materials to get the job done. Moving on to the wire then, we needed to consider the skin depth or how deeply current can penetrate into a solid copper conductor at our given frequency of 100 kHz. This allows us to strike a balance between conductor size and number of strands required. For our 100 kHz switching frequency, we selected 26 gauge wire, and this wire requires at least 20 parallel strands to handle the current required on the primary side winding without overheating. We accidentally wound our first transformer with 30 parallel conductors, which isn't necessarily a huge issue since it will only serve to reduce the resistive losses in our transformer, but I think that when I make the next one, I'll use 20 instead, managing Tinning and winding the 30 parallel strands was a huge hassle when we built this one, and then we'll pair this back to the design 40 strands total, 20 strands per winding in the next transformer we wind. This will likely take the form of two parallel 10 strand bundles for even further increased ease of assembly. Managing 30 strands of 26 gauge wire and tying all 60 of them together to the center tap? Yeah, making the primary side of this transformer was pretty much nightmare fuel. Oh. I almost forgot to mention, uh, the reason why we need to think about managing all these strands, bundling them together, etc., is for one simple reason. I'm cheap. There's an industry standard solution to this problem, as we mentioned before, and that's Litzwire. Litzwire comes from our German friends, or at least it's named by our German friends, so I assume they made it. Litzwire is sold with many strands of copper wire, insulated from one another and woven together with a type of woven insulation around it. This stuff is crazy expensive compared to standard magnet wire, but it becomes necessary as the switching frequency increases. If we needed a thousand strands of 60 gauge wire, that's when LITS is what you need. Since I don't want to deal with that extra cost, I'll take on the task of combining the strands myself. You'll have to make the right choice for you. The other area that could be easier if we had infinite money, actually tinning the strands. If we had a solder pot in the shop, which is exactly what it sounds like, a pot filled with molten solder, if we had this solder pot, we could simply dunk the wire bundle, or litz wire, into the molten solder to tin it. This would then burn off the insulation and tin the copper wire in one action if we added some flux. Our solution for now was tediously burning off the insulation of each strand and then cleaning the copper with sandpaper to restore solderability. With that done, we fed solder into the bundle with plenty of flux to allow it to wick into our 30 strand bundles of wire. With this primary winding taken care of and our dirty laundry out to dry, it's time to consider the secondary. The significantly reduced current on our secondary side winding demands only two strands of the same 26 gauge wire. However, we've added some margin here and called for four strands, and this is because we have a lot of wire length. The resistive losses in the secondary will be much larger than in the primary since there's only two turns. If we need to use more space on our bobbin for the primary windings, we'll be able to safely reduce this down to three strands. This reduction would also reduce the total quantity of copper required for the secondary by 25%, which would be pretty huge. Next, we considered the losses due to our design and then calculated the estimated temperature rise of this transformer under load. With our e-core volume, effective transformer to ambient thermal resistance, and the power dissipated in the transformer, our temperature rise would only be around 45 degrees C under full load. This is considering both losses in the windings and the magnetic losses. Now that should be perfectly acceptable for our application, and because that'll be acceptable for our winding insulation, capped on tape, and the PETG used in the bobbin. If something starts to get melty or catches on fire, that'll be a key indicator that we made an invalid assumption in these calculations or the transformer was not wound correctly. We'll finish off these calculations by estimating the cost of our transformer. This will consider the wire used to wind this transformer, the two e-core halves, and the bobbin. The cost estimate came out to a little less than $12 for the finished transformer, copper, core, and all. For comparison, a line frequency transformer capable of handling the same amount of power came out to around $150. So this is a pretty awesome cost optimization. With our transformer design complete and the cost for the transformer and our UPS reduced from $150 down to $12, let's wind a transformer to put a button on this chapter of our story. The primary objective is that we're going to wind some wire onto the primary and secondary windings of this transformer. And to do that, I've made a couple of jigs. The first jig uses this continuous rotation servo motor and some auxiliary pieces as well as this servo tester to rotate 
the bobbin itself. That should allow me to, once I have a winding, just follow it along from right to left, and then just focus on getting the windings spaced correctly and not worrying about spinning this while I did it. I, I just don't have enough hands. So beyond that, down here we have an indexing jig, which will allow me to poke some wire in that hole and begin winding it back and forth between these two mounts on the table. And then I can just continue to rotate it, and that should help me to get a nice and consistent distance for all of these pieces of wire. And then what I can do is I can chuck this up in the drill when we're done, and then actually twist the winding together to make it easier to keep track of so that when we wind twice around this bobbin for our two primaries, we'll be able to do it in a very repeatable way. I ran into a couple issues when we were trying to use this winding jig. Um, I, the main issue is just that the fingers weren't long enough, so I kept fighting with the wires falling off the jig itself. Not really ideal, not what I would like to see, but uh, in, in the end it worked. Um, really just served to help us count, because I don't know if you ever tried to do anything like this, a uh, tedious, monotonous task that requires counting. Um, it's pretty easy to get off by one or two or three or five without a jig like this, so even if it didn't work quite as well as I would have hoped, we did find a way to make it work, as you're about to see. Yeah, we're just pulling pulling wire off the bobbin and winding it. Eventually we'll get out some zip ties and kind of bundle that more. So now, now that we've got the wires a little more bundled, what we're doing here is we're going to just clip off all those loops on both ends. And once that's done, I wrapped this in some Kapton tape to protect the bundle and chucked it up in a drill that's kind of hiding off camera. And the reason why I did that was just because I didn't want to completely destroy the insulation, the, the enamel coating on the copper, but we did need to chuck it up in the drill to, to spin it. Yeah, my regret here is that when we were bundling this wire, I didn't clip the ends, that far end, and it, it really got tangled up, so we had to kind of pull it back apart. There were like three or four bundles of about, I don't know, seven to ten wires each, and we got it mostly fixed, but never really got it to the right diameter. Thankfully, there was too much wire here, so we just tripped off or trimmed off the end. Um, that wasn't quite right. <laughs> yep, and this is the first one that we built, so there's going to be little issues like that. But all in all, I think I think the winding turned out pretty good. So, so what we're doing now is we just wound the primary on the, well the two primary windings they're wound now, just try to make them as square as possible and really compress them down in there. And this is where that second jig comes into play, where we're going to use it to spin our transformer to get the secondary wound. There's a, a lot of windings required here. I think it was 32, 32 windings, so, yeah, yeah, that took quite a while, but thankfully, with the cap, oh, so the capped on tape, kind of got ahead of myself there, so the capped on tape that we're wrapping around the winding, the reason why we did that is because whenever you twist something like an enamel insulation, it can develop little fractures along its length, 
and if there were two fractures on the enamel wire right next to one another on this transformer, it would be a lot easier for it to arc over. Likewise, that's the same reason why we're adding the capped on tape between layers, because winding to winding when they're adjacent, they'll have, you know, 20, 30 volts between the windings. But on the adjacent like on the adjacent tubes of windings like you go from right to left and then you go from left to right and the two windings ended up being on top of each other instead of next to each other at very worst would have that 20 volts times about 20 or around 20 so yeah like 200 volts from winding to winding on the vertically adjacent windings and so what that demands is a little bit of an insulating barrier more than what's just required for the wire itself I, again I'm being pretty cautious here the winding insulation itself is rated for I think like one one or two kilovolts before it'll break down but if there's fractures in that coating it could arc over between two cracks in that insulation because then all you've got is air and the air is not going to insulate as well as that enamel. Yep, so the, the final step here is just taking some Kapton, wrapping it around the outside. Just keeps the windings from like coming off the transformer, it keeps it nice and tidy. And that's where we get into the soldering process. I wish I did a better job of filming this. As you're about to see, there's going to be a lot of jump cuts here and a lot of missing footage. And it's because I just zoomed in. <laughs> and then I did a lot of the work kind of off to the left, which is really frustrating because I wanted to capture this for you, but we can always revisit it. Basically what I'm doing is just tinning the wires. So we're cutting the wires to length, tinning the wires, and then soldering them down onto those headers. Just added a little bit of glue on those headers, like um, a gel-based super glue. And we did that to provide some mechanical support for the transformer. Yeah, This was um, a bit of a learning process where we were at first experimenting with the best way to clean off the windings. It started with, oh, let's try just solvent. And then it was, well, that didn't work too well. Let's try fire. I was like, okay, well, that seemed to help. Then I tried fire and the solvent and that didn't work as well as we would have liked. And then what it ended up being is fire and then sandpaper and then solvent to to clean up those wires. This is the part where I I was a little better about keeping it in frame while soldering. And these are the gigantic bundles. So there's what you're seeing me solder there in the middle. That's 60 strands of magnet wire coming together on that one terminal. 60 strands. I don't know about you, but I think that winding our transformer went pretty well. I'm happy with the result of our effort, and I'm truly shocked at how small this thing is, considering how much power it can handle. The windings are organized well, thanks to our split bobbin, and the primary windings are as symmetrical as we can get them winding by hand. Therefore, this new transformer should meet our specifications for the push-pull converter. Our transformer is complete, we secured the core using an off-the-shelf bracket. This bracket applies sufficient pressure to the two halves of the core, and this ensures that they're in good contact, that there's no gap between them. A gapped core is something that can be used to cause a transformer to store some energy instead of transferring it all instantly from primary to secondary. This action is really useful in something like a flyback transformer, because flyback converters function more like coupled inductors than transformers. In our application, a gap would likely cause our transformer to rapidly burst into flames, since it's not designed to handle even handle storing even a small fraction of the power passing through it. I cannot wait to see this transformer powered on for real as a component in our UPS. 
this transformer will be absolutely critical to ensuring the functionality and reliability of our system. Subscribe to be notified of our future videos where we'll keep this project moving by implementing soft start functionality on our different voltage rails and walk through the detailed design of our custom battery charging circuit. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!